Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone, here with a solo podcast today. Uh, if you haven't followed me, I did write an article called The Best Ball Manifesto, A Guide to Winning Big on Underdog Fantasy on Establish the Run. It's a really lengthy article, so I'm taking some time to break down parts of that article into podcast episodes that are hopefully a little bit more digestible and let me go you know, somewhat off the cuff and hopefully turn on turn the theory of that article into some stuff that's pretty actionable for your drafts in Best Ball Mania 4. Stacking is what I'm going to talk about today. It's part one of the Best Ball Manifesto, but I did actually go out of order with these podcasts and have previously recorded one on part two, which is on ADP value. So make sure to check that out if you haven't already. But yeah, the Best Ball Manifesto, the goal behind this was basically to really parse through the teams in last year's Best Ball Mania tournament, Best Ball Mania 3 and Underdog Fantasy, and figure out what characteristics of teams lended themselves towards really increasing you know, your odds of winning this huge tournament and just increasing your total expected value. And it's hard to do that with some of the traditional analysis we've seen on best ball roster construction and stuff in previous years where it's either focused you know, primarily on regular season advance rates, which is really useful. And I'm going to talk about today, but it's limited because these really huge prize pools are handed out almost primarily to what you do in week 17 for these tournaments. So given that we need to start measuring and analyzing teams through that lens. Now this year's best ball mania does have a portion of the prize pool, the regular season, which is great, but you still want to be really thoughtful of optimizing for the playoffs. So how do we actually do that? And some analysis in the past has looked at playoff advance rates and finals advance rates, meaning the characteristics of the actual drafted best ball mania teams that made it to those week 17 finals. So last year, 470 teams made it to the week 70 finals, analyzing what those teams looked like compared to the field. That can be useful, but it can be super noisy because essentially what you have is three uncorrelated tournaments in a row that you need to win to get there. And we want to figure out how to win those. But just looking at what happened last year in three random weeks, weeks 15, 16, and 17, is really noisy and a super small sample. So the way I got around that to try and tease out how do you actually achieve this weekly upside that you need to win these playoff weeks was to pretend any of the playoff entrants into Best Ball Mania 3 last season um, that any of the weeks could have been a playoff week. So week one through week 17 and looked at each of those weeks individually and whether these teams had the requisite weekly upside to have advanced if that week was a playoff week, meaning did they have a top 10% score, which is what you would have needed to win a quarterfinals, which one out of 10 teams advanced. Did they have a top one out of 16 score? What you would have needed to win is semifinals. Or did they have a top one out of 470 score, um, which is what you would have needed to win week 17 of the finals last year in Best Ball Mania 3. So basically came up with weekly point thresholds that mimic you know, where you needed to be in terms of weekly upside to have gotten the correct advancement or winning in these playoff rounds. So I think the way I did it is it's imperfect, but I think it's a step in the right direction of uncovering a bit more signal as to you know, just how we should construct those teams to take advantage of the playoffs. A couple of caveats, things that I don't like about my methodology, um, by looking at just point thresholds on a given week and not looking at like three consecutive weeks in a row, you do lose some of the, I guess, the gist of how the actual contest is played because we do get three uncorrelated tournaments in a row. And there's some things with like getting unique rosters and stuff like that, that might matter that my data is just not going to catch at all. There's also correlations that you can make on your team without the quarterback that I think are important and can be helpful. Anyone who's played DFS, we know as we refer to these as mini correlations. So you can kind of have stacks of games, stacks of teams without the quarterback that I think are going to increase your weekly upside, but they're not caught by my data because frankly, it was just kind of hard to tie the data together. And it was just easier to look at stacks through the lens of the quarterback, even though I know sometimes the quarterback is the least important part of the stack. I think in best ball, that's not necessarily true. We still, you know, the quarterback's pretty important in terms of tying that together, but there are 
ways you can get at correlation that's going to improve your odds of winning that aren't, aren't going to be measured by my data because my data is only looking at stacks with the quarterback. But I mentioned we would get to regular season advance rates, and we can start there. And uh, I've got a chart up if you're looking, watching this on the Established Run YouTube channel. But basically, what we see is even in the regular season, stacking helps advance rates. Now, it's not huge shifts, but if you look at the number of quarterbacks rostered in a team and then break down how many of those quarterbacks were stacked, the more that were stacked, the higher the advance rate in every bucket. So if you drafted two quarterbacks, for example, your best advance rate in the two quarterback segment was having two of those quarterbacks stacked followed by having just one of them stacked and then followed by having zero of them stacked, which was the worst. Same thing with three quarterbacks. If you drafted three quarterbacks, your advance rate was best if you stacked three, next best if you stacked two, next best if you stacked one, and worst if you stacked zero. So overall, if you just looked at number of stacked QBs, stacking three quarterbacks might look bad compared to stacking two. That's less to do with stacking and more to do with Last season, only taking two quarterbacks in general was kind of a big edge over taking three quarterbacks. But if you did take three quarterbacks, it was better to stack them all than to not stack them. So we know that, you know, stacking helps in terms of advancing. I think there's a couple reasons for that. The first reason is the seasonal correlation. I think it's just huge. You know, you're investing in a team and if the team does well, you know, everyone's going to pay off in some capacity. There are some stuff with spike weeks and weekly upside, especially if you have multiple stacks where they can kind of play off one another and hopefully the distributions work in your favor. But ultimately I think, you know, when you're, when you have to be top two out of 12, you want to make correlated bets. You want to be a little bit riskier in that, you know, this correlated bet on a team, it might not pay off. And if it doesn't, you're probably not going to advance, but you know, only two out of 12 teams advance anyways. And if it does pay off, you're jumping a bunch of teams. The other thing is just, I do always think there's some bias in this data where the sharper players are probably stacking more and therefore teams that are stacked have higher advance rates, not necessarily because they're stacked, but because that's how sharper players are drafting. It's hard to parse out that from the data. It's impossible. So but it is important to realize that there are things in the data that might be explained by other reasons that we're not considering. And that's that's one of them. If we look at total number of players stacked and its impact on advance rates, we see this too. Is And, and when I say players stacked, I'm talking about skill, any skill player who is on the same team as one of your quarterbacks could be a running back, wide receiver, or tight end. Later on, when I get into game stacks in the playoffs, I think for playoff upside in particular, the pass catchers matter more than the same team running backs because we want those specific spike weeks. Whereas for season long, I think the running back is important to have with the quarterback too because they're both going to do really well over the course of the season if the offense rolls, even if they kind of cannibalize each other on any given week in terms of pure raw upside. But yeah, you see in terms of total number of skill players stacked with your quarterback, anywhere from three to five players was best for your regular season advance rates. Um, and a lot of this analysis too, I want to get overly precise with like what the best advance rate is for four stacked players versus five stacked players. But the cohort analysis shows clear trends in a lot of this. And this is one of them where three through five players, the data is nice, neat, and clean. Those are the only three situations where a team had an above above that of randomness advance rate is if you stacked anywhere from three to five of your skill players with any one of your quarterbacks it doesn't have to be all one quarterback could be with any of them and then you had a below average advance rate if you did less than that you had a below average advance rate if you did more than that and i think on the low end if you're not making those correlated bets you just have a tougher parlay to hit in order for your team to be really good in advance out of the regular season on the high end, you know, I think six to seven players wasn't terrible, but when you got into like eight to nine, which not a lot of teams did, it was really bad though. And I think then you're just asking for too much out of one team where it's just unrealistic for all those players on the team to hit together. And, and, 
you know, the team, even if it hits, is going to have some bad weeks. And in those situations, you, you know, you don't have enough coverage from skill players from other teams because you've just got too much tied up. So three to five players was ideal for regular season advance rate. Okay. Um, but the big thing is like playoffs, right? Like that's all great. The regular season advance rate stuff is pro stacking. I think basically the importance for that to me is just if you're worried about stacking, if you think like, oh, what's the point of stacking for the playoffs when I need to get there to begin with? Stacking is helping you get there in the first place as well. And I did a whole podcast on ADP value. So I'm not saying to reach like crazy on your stacks. I'm actually someone who doesn't reach a ton for my stacks, but I'm still pretty cognizant over the course of the draft to make sure to work in some correlation to my lineups. But the big thing is when we get to the playoffs, and I mentioned the methodology I did as far as trying to figure out, you know, your likelihood of winning a quarterfinals field, a semis field, or a finals field based on the number of stacked QBs. And we see that in all three of those playoff formats, whether it's winning a 10 person field, 16 person, or 470 person field, the more quarterbacks that you've stacked with a pass catcher, the better the win rates. And this is again where the cohort analysis is very clean. In the quarterfinals, having three stacked quarterbacks was better than two, which was better than one, which was better than zero. Same thing for the semifinals, same thing for the finals. And then when we looked at game stacked QBs, and when I say game stacked QBs, this means at least one same team pass catcher and one opposing skill player. So that could be a pass catcher or a running back. And the data is exactly the same. And it's even more pronounced there, especially in the finals where, you know, on average, you're going to win a finals week, like 0.21% of the time. If you had three game stacks in your arsenal on a given week, that 0.21% increases by like 62% up to 0.35% win rate. Now, the percentage increase is a huge number at 62%. We're dealing with pretty small numbers. So I want to get too caught up again in the exact number there. And less than 1% of teams actually had, you know, three game stacks on a given week, but 7% of teams had two game stacks on a week. And those teams had a 0.29% chance of winning, which is still nearly a 40% increase. And we also see a big increase for the semifinals fields and the quarterfinals fields, which is basically at all those levels, adding in the game stack in terms of bringing an opponent back onto an already established quarterback pass catcher stack increased your odds again. So this is why you hear people talking about week 17 game stacks a lot, even though it sounds kind of crazy to be worrying about week 17 when we don't even know, you know, so much that's going to happen between now and then. But the idea is if you get there, we do know the schedule. We do know kind of like the locations these teams are playing and we can build in some correlation that way. And that correlation definitively helps us achieve more weekly upside. And I thought this data might be skewed a little bit by the fact that you know, I'm considering weeks one through 17. So maybe, you know, I should be looking at just data at the second half of the year, or I should not be looking at data when bye weeks came in. Maybe that was messing with the numbers, but no matter how I sliced up the data, it pretty much all spat out the same, which is the more quarterbacks you have stacked with pass catchers and the more of those stacks that have an opponent coming back on a given week, the better your chance of winning any of the playoff sized fields, which is really, you know, huge. I did want though, to kind of extrapolate this out more and just say, okay, so we know you have a better chance of winning, but like, what does that mean? Like, can we look at the expected value of a team? And I did like a real loose expected value calculation, but essentially I looked at based on your team stacking structure, when you get to the playoffs, what is the odds of you winning the quarterfinals and then winning the semifinals and then winning the finals and just assumed kind of the average payout if you didn't win. So those are some not ideal assumptions, but they made us easily be able to get an expected value calculation. So just as an example, looking at number of quarterbacks rostered, for example. 
if you only rostered two quarterbacks, you had a 10.1% chance of winning the quarterfinals, a 6.3% chance of winning a semifinals field, and a 0.22% chance of winning the finals field. When we throw that all together, your expected value, once you've made the playoffs, I want to be clear about that. This isn't for the whole season. This is assuming you've made the playoffs. Your expected value is $137, which is more than the baseline expected value of $133. Whereas if you drafted three, if you made the playoffs with a three quarterback roster, those on average win a quarterfinals field, you know, 9.9% of the time, a semis field, 6.1% of the time, and a finals field, 0.2% of the time. Add that all together, you can expect a value of $129, which is $8 less than the two quarterback teams. Now, when we get into stacking, we'll see that three quarterbacks is still very viable. But just a loose example of how we can take these quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals estimated win rates and get an, an actual expected value deduction out of them. So let's look at game stacked quarterbacks um, in terms of playoff expected value. And imperfect, but teams that had zero game stack quarterbacks were the only segment of teams that actually had, you know, an expected value below that baseline expected value of around $133. So zero game stack QBs win the quarterfinals 10% of the time, the semi 6.3% of the time, and the final 0.19% of the time for $130 expected value. Uh, these make up the vast majority of teams are actually like zero game stack QBs, which I'll, I'll come to another chart and we'll see exactly how many of those are. But the expected value jumps to $139 if you had one game stack QB, up to $153 if you had two game stack QBs, and up to $164 if you had three game stack QBs. Now, I said this was imperfect because obviously you can't have three game stack QBs for each of the playoff fields. It's just like if you, you did because... You know, if you game stack them for week 17, it's very unlikely you also had them fully game stacked for the quarterfinals because you wouldn't have had those opponents coming back as well. You, of course, in order to have three game stacked at any points, you have three regular stacks, but um, a distinction there. But the point is that the more stacked your quarterback was, the more your expected value increased in the playoffs, which is where most of the money is. And if you to kind of put this into perspective, once you ma made the playoffs, if you had 35 teams that were just randomly constructed, they could be stacked, they might not be stacked, just a random team with a neutral expected value, 35 of those teams at $133 of EV is about $46.50 in terms of total value that you could expect out of those teams. That's equivalent to having 30 teams at somewhere between $150 and $160 EV. That puts you between $45 and $4,800. But um, the point I'm trying to make here, not to get too focused on those numbers, is it's really important to advance to the playoffs, but being really optimized for the playoffs can make up for having less teams advancing. Having 30 teams really optimally set up for the playoffs is just as good as having 35 teams randomly constructed. So wanted to, to note that. And then if we back into like how many, okay, so these game stacks are good, but like how many players should be a part of these stacks? And really the week, if you look at weekly finals, when estimated win rate, anywhere between three to nine players, total game stacks. So that is, any same team pass catcher with any of your quarterbacks and any opposing skill player with any of the quarterbacks helps you win on a single week, a 470 person field. Your win expectation is above average if you roster anywhere between three to nine total game stacked players. And the most optimal range was at the higher end of that, which was six to nine, which makes sense. You know, we saw for the regular season having three to five players, same team player stacked was ideal. Now, if you throw in some opponents on top of that and you take into account that stacking is a little bit more important in these single weeks, it makes sense that you get to that six to nine number being the optimal range. Once you get past that, again, it's too high. Once you get below that, you don't have enough correlation. And 
you know, 14% of teams had zero stacked players. 16% of teams only had one, 20% of teams had two. So like, a, like almost half these teams had between zero to two players, you know, game stacked on a given week. So we can put this all together, right? And look at your and derive a total expected value from the start of the season now, not just when you make the playoffs, by looking at the win rates in the quarterfinals and the semifinals based on number of quarterbacks that you have stacked, and then in the finals based on number of quarterbacks you have game stacked. And again, we'll work backwards from week 17. So we'll call week 17 game stacked and then week 15 and 16 regular stacked. If you take those estimated weekly win rates, the more stacking, the better. And again, the situation where the cohort analysis is very clear. So if you rostered two quarterbacks, you had none of them stacked. You had a lower expectation than average for regular season advance rate, for quarterfinals, for semifinals, and for winning the finals. Everything was reduced. And that netted you an expected value of $18, roughly. If you just stacked one of those quarterbacks, your expected value actually jumps decently up to $21, even if you didn't have any of them game stacked for weeks for week 17. If you had one quarterback's team stacked and game stacked in week 17, you jump up to $25. If you had both your quarterbacks team stacked and only one of them game stacked in week 17, that goes up to $27. If you had both quarterbacks, team stacked and game stacked, that jumps up to $31. And it's the exact same thing with three quarterbacks rostered. The more that you have team stacked, the higher expected value. The more you have team stacked and game stacked, the higher your expected value. That's where you're really starting to see increases across the board in the regular season quarterfinal semis and finals win rates. I will note that every combination of three quarterbacks does have a below average regular season advance rate, but you still get to really positive expected values on some of these heavily stacked three quarterback teams because of the increase in odds of winning a quarterfinal semifinals and a finals win rate. So um, yeah, this is why you hear a lot of people talking about stacking because it's, you know, it's super important and it's very clear when you look at single week upside, which mimics the upside that we need to win the playoff weeks, the more quarterbacks stacked, the better. The more games quarterback to game stacked, the better. So um, I was really glad I did this analysis this way so that we could tease this out. So um, I do want to look at a couple of reasons. One, it's always important to think of why, right? So a few things we need to think of. Um, the game stacks being so additive is something that I, you know, I'd love if someone else in the industry took a closer look at, I'd like to take a closer look at some point because I wouldn't have expected that to be so additive. And again, I'm talking about the chart where, you know, your expected value is great if you had two quarterbacks, both stacked, but it's crazy how, when you have them game stacked, it goes up even higher, how it's such an amplifier to have those opponent bring backs because in DFS, sometimes it's not that important, even though. In DFS, we can bring back like the best value on the opposing team, the best game theory play of the opposing team. We can do it at any price. We can do it at any position. And we know exactly what the roles are to take advantage of the correlation. In best ball, all we know is the schedule. So like, why is it so impactful in best ball? And you know, I have some ideas. I think one might just be optionality with best ball scoring where you're free rolling that correlation upside with the opponent because unlike DFS, you don't have to use that score if you throw in a bring back. If the game goes nuclear and the bring back as a result has a really high score, you bank that correlation win in a huge way. If your stack is decent, but the game doesn't go off and your opponent's skill player sucks for that week, well, it's best ball scoring. You know, there's a lot of other guys who score you can use. So there's some optionality with the correlation where it's like you bank the upside, but you kind of mitigate the downside because of the best ball scoring. Even with that said, I do think there's probably some randomness here where, you know, just the way the data worked out last year, it's making the game stacks look more valuable than my intuition probably says they are. But I do still think that they're they're pretty important. Um, 
Yeah. So I just wanted to mention those things, but as far as actionable takeaways here, there's a few things that I think are clear. One is if you can ever take a correlated piece in a best ball mania draft at a position you need at ADP or after you need to do it, you know, throw out your personal feelings about how much you like the player. I like the week 17 Minnesota Green Bay stack a lot. I do not like KJ Osborne as a value in a vacuum. But if I have a Green Bay Minnesota stack set up and I need a wide receiver at pick 155 and KJ Osborne's ADP is 153, I'm taking KJ Osborne. Even if there's five or six other wide receivers I like better, you're fighting too much upstream in terms of ignoring all these systemic things in terms of knowing that ADP value helps a lot in terms of knowing the importance of correlation. So auto take a correlated piece. If it's roughly the position that you need, or it's not going to hurt your positional allocations, it's correlated and it's at ADP or after do not overthink it. So take that into account. I think you want to try to stack all of your QBs in some way. I don't think you need to onslaught or go crazy in terms of overstacking some, you know, any single QB, but trying to have some correlation with all of your QBs, I think is really helpful. Once in a while, you know, I'm a greedy drafter. I try to get a ton of ADP value and net the correlation at the same time. Once in a while, I have a bad draft where, you know, I have a quarterback that's just the value and I wasn't able to work out the correlations and it's not an ideal draft for me, but for the most part, trying to stack all of them in some way, but not going crazy. I do have some quarterbacks where like I have a single stack in a week 17 bring back. I've got some quarterbacks where I've got like four teammates. You know, I think the chargers could go nuclear and there's some times where it works out where it's like, I've got Eckler, I've got Mike Williams, I've got um, Quentin Johnston, I've got Gerald Everett because they're available at different points in the draft at different positions. So I will at times make really heavy bets, but don't feel like you need to go nuts on a single team. The other thing is three quarterback teams, you know, especially if you're drafting early, like this time of year, I think three quarterback teams look a little bit better than they do last year for a couple of reasons. One, teams that are only drafting two quarterbacks and getting that elite quarterback early are paying a bigger price than in the past to draft that early quarterback, which might make three quarterback teams in general a little bit better for regular season advance rates. But I do like some of the subjective kind of uniqueness arguments for having three quarterbacks, three chances to kind of hit the roulette wheel of getting that correct game stack at any point during those three uncorrelated tournament weeks. So I think there's some things that work in favor of three quarterbacks, some that are captured by the data that I've shown you, which is like, it can be powerful to have three game stacks because any one of them can hit on a week. And some that my data doesn't tell you, which is like simulating those three uncorrelated tournaments all weeks in a row. I think there's some uniqueness there and some distribution stuff that works on the favor of three quarterbacks. Plus, you know, going back to the this time of year thing, a lot of the late round wide receivers and running backs are really fringe plays at this point, really likely to be dead roster spots, which can really hurt your chances of winning. Whereas you can get some starting quarterbacks late if you're taking three. The final thing, something that I haven't done a good job of, I'd like to work in more, but I'd say, the industry in general is pretty on week 17 stacks. I think we have a bubble though, where it's likely not occurring by the masses as much as you think. And when I looked at the data last year, and some people have looked at the data this year, the week 17 game stacking is happening at a higher rate than you would expect coincidentally, but not, not by a huge amount. But I certainly think weeks 15 to 16 are probably undervalued. And if you can kind of find common opponents, like if you have three quarterbacks and you know some of the common opponents within that three-week window, 15 to 17, that they play, I think that's really interesting to try and lean into that a little bit more. And, you know, if you can't make the week 17 game stack work, you can't, you don't really have an opponent bring back on, you know, a double stack you've set up, look at their schedule for weeks 15 to 16 because stacking and game stacking – and the quarterfinals, semifinals matters too. And you know, simply getting to the finals, you can get you can get lucky. So make sure to to check that out. So I think that's what I have on stacking. Um, unfortunately, I didn't really ever come up with a great break-even 
decision point on like when should you stack versus go to ADP value? Because what I've seen, if you listen to the ADP episode, both are really important. And actually like the expected value is going to eke out if you do, do like the best of the best ADP value versus the best of the best playoff stacking optimization. Like the EVs calcs are like pretty similar overall. And again, like these are additive cumulative decisions. So it's not like there's any one point in the draft where it's like, I'm going to either get all the correlation I want or all the ADP value I want. So th there might be a point where it's like, do I reach eight picks for this guy that's correlated or do I take, you know, someone who's a full round of ADP value who fell it can be tough. And I haven't really found a good answer to it, but you know, ultimately the total ADP value of your team is based on every single pick you make. If you're setting up two to three game stacks for week 17 on your team, that's going to require like a third to almost a half of the entire picks you make in the draft. So there's never going to be just like one decision point where it's going to swing your ADP value versus your correlation. Um, but yeah, I thank everybody for taking the time to listen to this. I know this one was a little bit harder to do on audio because it was somewhat data intensive. So I apologize if it was tough to follow at times. It might be an easier one to have watched the established to run YouTube video because I had some of the graphics up without when I get into some of the other parts of the manifesto, like what time of year to draft and whatnot, I think it'll flow a little bit better than this episode, but I still hope that you found it useful to listen to some of that data and yeah, make sure to check out the best ball manifesto if you haven't already. Again, it's a long document, but you can skim it and just check out the parts that you're most interested in. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at two hats, one mic. And if you like and review the podcast, it helps me a ton to continue doing episodes like this for free. Thank mm -hmm. you.